Welcome, everyone. We are so excited for tonight's topic. I've been waiting for this one, <laughs> Dr. Carol. So, like, I think you've been <laughs> looking forward to the education one, and I've really been looking forward to the psychology one. Uh, it's reflective of our individual disciplines. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, but before we get started tonight, uh, I wanted to um, apologize for a mistake that I made in conversation last week. Um, when we were talking about the controversy um, about Whoopi Goldberg's words um, about um, race and um, the Jewish people during the Holocaust, I repeatedly said Judaism, which is a religion, when I should have referred to the Jewish people. Although there's some overlap between those two concepts, they are distinct. You can uh, be Jewish and not practice Judaism. Um, so I apologize for the imprecision of my language. And uh, I also wanted to say with gratitude uh, that one of, one of the students in this class very graciously took the time to point this out to me. And I thought it was a really nice model of how when people make mistakes, um, we can, we can kind of extend a little bit of, of goodwill uh, to, to that person and, and do some educating uh, in some cases. Um, so thank you. I also wanted to point out, it occurred to me as really not funny exactly, but it was very meta that I made a mistake when talking about race in a conversation that was, what do we do when people make mistakes when talking about race? So um, my apologies for, uh, for that mistake. Um, I also wanted to give a quick shout out. Uh, hopefully you got to see the announcement earlier today. We're gonna get to meet finally, right, Dr. Carol? This is- yes. We've been trying to do this for so long. We are going to get to share a meal on this campus. Um, so earlier today, you should have received a sign-up link. Uh, we are limited to 100 people uh, to come and join us in person on campus, uh, in part because of space and in part because of we're trying to still be responsible with COVID numbers. They're decreasing, but we still don't want to have a rave with all 500 of you guys. <laughs> there are more than 500 of you in this class now. Um, so the first 100 who register will be able to join us in person. We are still planning to live stream. We aren't entirely sure yet what the format of that live stream is going to be, but we will be here both online and in person on LRS campus. Um, I'm told that the food is gonna be delicious by our director of dining services. Yes, and I should probably jump in here and just also um, thank those of you who came out with Betty Lore, our community book club leader on Monday to talk about um, our Robert Peace book. And um, it was a great conversation. I was able to join in on that conversation and we're looking forward to uh, many other conversations surrounding the book and connection to the ideas in our course. Um, if you didn't make it, and I know some of you sent an email saying, oh, you couldn't make it for whatever reason, um, that will be every Monday at 7 p.m. And um, we will send a reminder with that Zoom link and that Zoom link did come in an email. Um, so for those of you who signed up, um, it's, there's still time for you to join in on those conversations. And so I guess we should go ahead and get started. And I'll just remind you about our format for this particular class. Um, so Professor Hewitt will just kind of open up with them some speaking for about 10 minutes or so. And um, then we'll open up questions um, to you all. And we of course have some questions as well. And so we invite you to put your questions in the Q&A function here um, on Zoom. And of course, we are going to respect your time and we're gonna end the session at seven. So that means we will not probably get to all of the questions and we always have so many great questions. Um, but please do put your questions in that Q&A function and we will try to get to many, as many as possible. Keep in mind that the video will be available though tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So you can always tune in there and, and go back to the parts you wanna hear more of. Um, so without further ado, I think we will go ahead and have uh, Dr. Newton introduce Professor Hewitt. And it is my pleasure to do so. Uh, so we work in the same program, uh, Professor Hewitt and I, we both teach in psychology here at LR. Um, so she's an adjunct professor of psychology here at Lenore Ryan University. And in addition to that, challenging position. Uh, she's also a licensed clinical mental health counselor at Crossroads Counseling Center here in Hickory. Uh, Professor Hewitt has over 15 years of experience working with adolescents and adults in various settings, including local school systems and nonprofit agencies. 
she considers all her work an opportunity to serve others. And Michelle is passionate about helping students develop a love of continuous learning and exploration, as well as helping people move beyond their past and present experiences to live lives that are genuine, fulfilling, healed, and on their own terms. All of those things sound great. We should talk more, Professor Hewitt. <laughs> uh, in between teaching and providing therapy services, Professor Hewitt serves as a facilitator of an emotional support group and is a board member for uh, some, several local organizations. Her greatest joy is spending time with family. So welcome, Professor Hewitt. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you so much. Um, just before and, you continue that, yeah, I'm just that, gonna that was in. I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Carroll's yeah. going to introduce our other yeah, guests. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wanna make sure we introduce our um, special guest who's coming to join this conversation, Ms. Jewel Gist. And um, she is a clinical social worker at RHA Health Services in Lenore, North Carolina. She earned her Master of Social Work degree from East Tennessee State University. She is the former acting director of multicultural student programs at UNC Asheville, where she worked to bring Joy DeGray, author of Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury, to UNC Asheville to open a conversation about transgenerational trauma with the entire campus community. And I know what a powerful book that is. She's also participated in training aimed at dismantling institutional racism in healthcare. And quite interestingly, she has a background as a medical herbalist. Welcome. Thank you. And Professor Hewitt, I'm so sorry. So like I, I led you off and then we cut you off. So no, 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 no. It, it's absolutely fine. It's okay. Um, so I just really, I, I'm really excited to get into the questions um, that we have, but I, I would like to just say, you know, I think this is an amazing forum to have such a neat, much needed conversation about race in general, but, you know, talking from a psychological perspective and thinking about how we approach race and how race plays in our minds um, is such an emotion, is, is such an important conversation. Um, and, you know, from a psychological point of view, we talk about, we have to look at race from a biological standpoint. We look at it from a psychological standpoint. We also have to look at it from an emotional standpoint. Um, and oftentimes we get so caught up in the emotional part of it that we don't really examine the other portions. And so it's been my pleasure to prepare and to share this information so that we can kind of take on this humongous um, concept and really bring it down to what we can do as individuals and how it plays out in our minds. Um, so I, I appreciate this opportunity and I'm looking forward to just jumping right in and seeing where we go with this. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you and your perspective <laughs> because, okay, so to this point in the class, like we've talked about understanding race and racism from different perspectives when we started with a historical understanding and then we moved into a biological understanding. And then last week, Dr. Stokes led us through kind of understanding racism in a more systemic way. Uh, so the systems of our society, including educational systems, criminal justice systems, uh, economic systems, all of those systems and how racism plays out there. So Professor Hewitt, my question for you is, is psychology, it's the study of the individual, right? How individuals think, feel, and behave. And um, what's the relationship between uh, racism in the mind, even, even in the minds of those who, I don't know, who may, may not necessarily be someone we would call racist, right? But just in the minds of people, what's the relationship between racism at that level and racism at the level at which we've been addressing it so far? So the social cultural construct and racism baked into uh, systems in our society. Do they relate to one another? Does one lead to the other or vice versa? So I think there is absolutely, there is absolutely a relationship. Um, systems are built by individuals. So in order for a system to be built, there has to be some sort of lead in. Um, and that lead is, in is individuals with a mindset, with a belief, with a desire, whatever word that you'd like to use, that sort of pushes forward in order to create these systems that we have. Um, and, and so we think about, uh, 
people who feel like, who are a part of dominant culture, dominant society, wanting to protect what they have, their position, their power, um, their economic status, whatever the case may be. And so what are the thoughts, what are the behaviors that help to ensure that those things are maintained? And so that's where this study of racism in the mind comes in, is we have to look at the individual. We have to look at those individual facets of racism, microaggressions, which we've talked about, bias, which we've talked about, emotion. But when we pull all of that apart, the fear of losing control, the fear of losing power, the fear of being made to, 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 to appear or less than, and what do I do? What is it in my mind that triggers the thought that if I share this space, if there is equality, um, then what does that say about me? What is the narrative that I create about that? And then how I jump from that narrative to doing the things that ensure that I stay in the position that I'm in, that I can I maintain the power that I have. And so that's the relationship. We would not have the systems if there were not a basis in individual thought processes and behaviors that come into play with that. Does it have to be conscious? Absolutely not. Most what we find is most of where we are in our mind is unconscious. It's learned behavior. It's what we observe. You know, we talk about social learning theory. We learn what we observe. So you think about even today, we think about how is it that we're in 2022 and we're still having, we still must have conversations about race and racism because learned behavior is still showing up. Young people are still seeing their parents, their elders, um, people in their community um, with saying certain things, acting and behaving in certain ways, and they are learning that which perpetuates Okay, and it becomes learned behavior and it becomes something that happens unconsciously. And it is until we can bring those things to the forefront of our consciousness that we can really address them. But there again, once we bring it to the forefront, now the fear sets in again. And we have to fight about, oh, well, I gotta keep my position. I don't wanna, you know, if I admit to this, if I, if I open myself up to this, what does that say about me? And so most of it, you know, when we deal with racism, so much of racism is undercover, it's unknown. It's, it, you know, we talk about explicit and implicit bias. You know, we focus on implicit bias, particularly because it's that bias that we are not aware of. You know? Right, and you know, this, as it always is pertaining to race, you know, it's a tough topic. It's not an easy topic. Um, and um, so I don't know, as I've been preparing for this conversation, I, I expected us to really get into some nitty gritty that connects to mental and emotional and all of that. Um, we have though a couple questions coming in um, from students. And I think this will be a good follow-up to this discussion. Um, this is from Betty Lore, and she says in her essay from the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah Jones states that the violence against Blacks was meant to control and terrify, but also served as a psychological bomb for white supremacy. In other words, you would not treat human beings that way. The extreme violence was a symptom of the psychological mechanism to absolve white Americans of their original sin. So the question is, can you speak to the kind of group psyche that, um, enables people to tolerate such inhumane treatment? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So part of what we have to think about and, and what comes to mind be, because it is, it's, it's current and it's fresh and it's new, we think about the January 6th insurrection mm -hmm. and the group mentality of what was happening at that time in that moment. So we know that there is this phenomenon that typically people who are in a group tend to act in ways mitigated by the group that they would not normally act in. 
So when we look at the history of race and racism and the group mentality, what we find is, um, you know, again, coming, you know, images are coming to mind. I remember these images of um, white adults, white students yelling and screaming and throwing things at a young black girl who was walking into school being escorted, the mentality, the hatred that it that appeared, the anger that appeared. And it's it, we talk about energy, the energy behind the power and control. We have to do this. We have to behave this way and we have to do it with such force in order to maintain our position. And so it becomes about power and control. It comes in it and it and so you have that energy that plays into that group mentality, um, that group that says, I feel stronger. Because think about it. How many of those, how many people would act the way, behave the way they, that they did on January 6th if they were standing alone? Not many people would have done that. But because they had the energy, because they had the collective um, mindset that really propelled their belief system, their value system, all of those things, then there was an undercurrent that they rode the wave, so to speak. Does that make, does that make sense? Sure. And it, you know, it makes me think about if we go all the way back to even um, before reconstruction, um, you know, before the civil war, um, there's in another class we're studying about education during that time. And there's a quote I wanna share that I think speaks to this. And this is from Heather Williams text called Self-Taught. And it's about the education of African-Americans um, from slavery time to more contemporary times. And the quote says, maintaining a system of bondage in the age of enlightenment depended upon the masters being able to speak for the slave to deny his or her humanity and to draw a line between slave consciousness and human will, end quote. And so as we talk about this whole group mentality, I think about in our current age of just Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, the DEI efforts, um, how far do you think we've come in affirming that humanity um, in dealing with that kind of group mentality? Miss Miss Just, this is right up your right up yeah. your alley, right? I know. I'm, I am about to jump out of my seat. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> jump in. Yeah. Please. Come on. The other thing, I wanted to take a step back to the idea of whiteness to begin with. When I mean, there was a time where there was no such thing, but when whiteness became just rose up, then there was the othering of other people. And for example, Africans were looked at as beast of burdens. So when you have this cognitive dissonance, it prepares you to treat people inhumanely. You know, if you find some inhumanity in someone, then you, there is this process of how you treat them inhumanely. And then the process goes through. And I remember reading once about, um, I think it was in a narrative therapy um, session that I had that talked about how we come to think the way we do. So oftentimes, if you have a man and a woman, let's say that's those are the only two people on earth, and they decide on who's going to do what. Somebody's going to do the cooking. Uh, somebody's going to go hunt and get the food. And they have children. And they say, well, that's the way our parents did it. And five or four generations later, it's, well, that's just how it's done. You know, it becomes that's how it's done. So when you have this group think that that occurs, then when you're moving through this timeline, you can see that process. I mean, when you think in terms of, for example, the papal bull, which was the document that pre-existed um, the the doctrine of discovery, what it said was, you can confiscate land or any goods that belong to infidels. So that was a document that went out through the Catholic Church and Columbus sailed under that document. And so when you think about how long that 
has existed and what's happened, it's not surprising when you when you think about how it is so ingrained in everything, everything, the institution, everything that we do. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up in, in the fact that with, with the idea of whiteness, there is the othering of other people. In the, in the quote that you read, um, it talked about language um, and speaking and how, how speech and language plays a part. And I think we, we sometimes glaze over the importance of language and how people use language to continue to move forward their, whatever their agenda is, their idea is. So when we even go back to the beginnings of slavery and we think about one of the first, if you want to dismantle a group of people, what's the first thing that you do? You, you prohibit their language. It's particularly if their language is different from yours. So you forbid them from speaking their language. And so in that forbidding of speaking them their language, and then your language begins to change to a language that propels your um, agenda. And so how do we, how do we reinforce the message of dehumanization? We speak the language of dehumanization. So if I view you as less than, as I, if I other you and I speak to you in terms of othering, that then becomes ingrained, that then becomes, you know, over the course of time, that then becomes the language that I, as the oppressed, begin to speak, which again, perpetuates, keeps the cycle going. And so I think we have to also, you know, and then, I mean, as we talked about, you know, microaggressions, we talk about bias, look at the importance of language in those things, in, in those concepts. So we move, we, we move this, this, even this group mentality, this continued dehumanization, we give it power through the thing, the words that we say, or, and, and, or the words that we do not allow our oppressors to say. So even thinking about this term, you know, the term, the, the, the idea of Black Lives Matter, those words, look at, look at the amount of emotion, controversy, you know, that has come out of simply saying Black Lives Matter. There has to be this rebuttal. No, we can't say Black Lives Matter. It has to be all lives matter, which again, dehumanizes. It takes the place of, that's the power of language. That's the power language has in this idea of racism and race. I guess I just wonder, you know, I always think about how do we unlearn? And if we go back to our first speaker, um, Dr. McCombs, she challenged us to unlearn what we have learned about race um, through socialization. And um, I just wonder, you know, how can we unlearn or is it so ingrained? And I know there's some brain research that I'm aware of that says, well, new experiences and even through therapy can create new pathways in the brain um, that would cause us to associate different meanings to things and perhaps give different meanings to traumatic experiences. And so how can we uh, implement that? Is that what we need to be doing? Do we? Will, we need certain experiences to begin to unlearn? Well, I, I think that, you know, through brain research, we do know that new experiences give us new meaning. But here's the thing. If I am not open to a new experience, how do I have that new experience? And I believe that is the basis of our challenge because there are people who are very much closed mind who are very much not, oh, this is what I believe, this is what it is, and this is where I'm going to stay. Mm -hmm. And so that, became, that becomes the real challenge of, yes, we need experiences. I cannot, um, for instance, you know, Dr. Dr. Newton was talking about her, her misstep with the conversation last week. You know, if I am not open to having a conversation about who the Jewish people are, 
what they believe, what their experiences are. If I just take what I know and run with it, then am I open to change? And the answer is no, because it is so ingrained. Now, but from, from a brain standpoint, can we change? Can we unlearn? Yes, we can. But we are also human beings who have a will. And if my will prohibits me from being open to those new experiences, if I have, if I have such a resolve that I am not going to attend a church service at an African-American church, I will never know the ins and outs, the nuances of spirituality from an African-American perspective. If I am so tied to my resolve that I will never walk into um, you know, a, a, a synagogue, I will never understand or know. I can never unlearn my preconceived notions about what happens in a synagogue or in a Buddhist temple or, or anything because I'm not, I'm not allowing myself that opportunity. I think, you know, forums like this, these forums are out there and I'm so excited to hear, you know, there are 500, over 500 people who are taking part in this. That's amazing. But for every person that is taking this opportunity, there is a person out there that says, I'm not doing that because race doesn't matter. This reminds me of the article that you had us read, Professor Hewitt, that Kaiser, Kaiser et al article that talked about mm -hmm. resistance to trainings that have become so ubiquitous, right? So like these DEI employer mandated trainings, I think that are often implemented with the best of intentions, but that article showed, I think what some people have kind of intuitively picked up on is that sometimes uh, if, if they're not done <laughs> well, they can produce resistance, reactance, defensiveness. Um, white people can kind of retreat to a banner of, well, this is reverse racism um, or um, victimhood, uh, so something along those lines. And it sounds like you're saying, and I wonder if Ms. Gist agrees with this, that you're saying one of the anecdotes to ineffective blanket trainings, diversity trainings that aren't doing much and maybe even causing more harm that it's challenging people in their experiences. So not just sitting in a classroom and learning, but going and seeking out encounters that might help you to grow and change. Is that a fair? What, what do you think, Ms. Gist? Oh, and also starting the conversation. Um, Professor Hewitt had a really good point about language and what that means. And I was thinking about the newest book by Brene Brown, uh, Atlas of the Heart. And, and she talks a lot about um, the language of emotions and what that means. And I remember one of the, um, the statements, well, actually I have the book on my desk. So one of the things she said was language is our portal to meaning making, connection, healing, learning, and self-awareness. Um, and she, she quotes a philosopher, and I'm going to torture his name. His name is Ligwig uh, Wittgenstein. And it says, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. Mm -hmm. So having a conversation, you know, um, and she did this out of surveying multiple people who only had the emotions of sad, mad, or uh, happy. And she said, there's mo multiple ways to describe those things. So what do we do around that language? And she goes on to say that language kind of speeds up and strengthens the connection in the brain um, when we are processing sensory information. So mm -hmm. language is a huge piece of, of just having those conversations and and not being afraid to ask questions. I mean, I appreciate that, you know, as, as part of the BIPOC community, when, when people ask questions instead of assuming. So I think that's really important, the communication piece. Absolutely, and I, I think that part of um, the issue with communicating and why there is resistance um, is 
because of the discomfort. And that, you know, connects to one of the articles that we, we read for this week about the Republican Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, um, pushing the um, white discomfort bill. And so it would prohibit public schools and private businesses from making white people feel discomfort when they teach students or train employees about discrimination in the nation's past. Um, and so when, when discussing the history and discussing having these hard conversations, um, you know, I would say, you know, both white and black and others feel some discomfort. So it is not just white discomfort, uh, there's black discomfort. And some would argue, so if there's all this discomfort, then let's just not talk about it. Um, so what would you say to those people? You know, they may say, okay, why do we wanna keep bringing up and opening old wounds? You know, why not say we're in a new time now? Why do, why do we need to have these conversations? Well, you, you can't heal what you don't acknowledge. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's a, a huge part of it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think with, with discomfort and I'll have to, you know, just self-disclosure, I have discomfort every day, whether it's discussed or not, you know, just in the fact of what I've had to deal, deal with and also the transgenerational trauma, you know, that that's with me. It's just part of my DNA and, and, and actually knowing those things that happen. So it's not like those things don't come up. I'm just, it's, I'm reminded of them oftentimes, but um, if, just pushing through that discomfort, um, you're richer for it. It makes a huge difference. I'm sorry, uh, Professor Hewitt, I interrupted you. You were getting ready. No, 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 no you didn't. No, no, no. Um, what, I, what I was going to say is, you know, something that I, I often say, even to my clients, is we have to be comfortable, we have to become comfortable in discomfort because we, there will always be discomfort. And if we don't become comfortable with the, the, the discomfort, if we don't acknowledge that, hey, this hurts. If this, this doesn't feel good, this feels like I'm trying to put on like a two-year-old's coat and I don't like that. You know, If we don't acknowledge that, if we don't find a space of comfort in discomfort, we will perpetuate the sins and ills of our past. So again, we go back to this idea of how important language is and speaking mm -hmm. about it. And so this idea, you know, when, when, when in history can we ever point to a time where avoiding a situation made the situation better? Mm -hmm. It rears its ugly head at some point. I think about, you know, our, our nation's history and all of the wonderful advancements that we made and then the moment that there was an African-American, a black president that was elected, all of a sudden, all of that progression that we had made, it's like, well, what happened? Well, we've got a black president now. And it was like all of that stuff that had been brewing. And then we, you know, we go years down the road and we, the country elects um, President Trump. And then all of a sudden, all of that stuff that was sort of hidden and that we didn't talk about and that we thought we had healed and that we'd, we'd moved so, so far past, all of a sudden it reared his head. And here we are again on you know, February the 10th, 2022, having conversations about race. Because at some point we were like, oh, it doesn't feel good. We're not gonna talk about it. It's better. So we're just gonna leave it. We're gonna, we're gonna go status quo and it's gonna be okay. And what we're finding is the discomfort's gonna come. It's gonna show up. It's gonna arise and until we find a space that is comfortable in the discomfort, and that doesn't mean settling, that means going, okay, this doesn't feel good, but we have to do this. We have to have this conversation in order for us to do better and escape and come out of the discomfort. Wow, absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's really a good segue into um, that we have in the audience um, from a person called Tabby. I think I pronounced that correctly. Well, this person says one of the video resources mentioned that white parents do not usually mention race to their children. 
while parents of other races are teaching their children very early about race and what is expected of them. So as we talk about this discomfort, because part of it's pushing through the discomfort, the question is how can white parents open that conversation about race and what is important for them to teach their children about race? So I think it goes back to one of the, one of the facets is it goes back to experience. If it is a white parent, it is not inherent that they have those conversations because they are part of the dominant society. I, as a black woman with children, had to open that conversation. It was a must because it was it was um, vital. I think part of you know in my lecture we I talked about how fifteen percent of white in a study that was done fifteen percent of white people did not consider their race a vital part of their identity, whereas conversely seventy five percent of blacks said it is, a, Blacks said that it is a huge vital part of their identity. So as, as for, you know, for, for white parents, having that conversation, exposing your children to, to people who do not look like them in their classrooms, walking in the mall, down the street of downtown Hickory or wherever you are, um, having conversations, that's how you introduce you know, having introducing differences. If if everything around you looks like you, you don't have an an, an in into well the differences because nothing looks different. Mm -hmm. I remember I remember when I moved when when my family moved to North Carolina. Um, I was about seven years old, eight years old. I moved from the Bronx in New York. Um, <laughs> in my neighborhood there was. It, it, it was like the rainbow. And we moved to Conover, North Carolina. And all I saw were people who were white people. And I remember asking my mom, where's everybody else? And she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, where is everybody? Like, I don't see any, I don't see any Puerto Ricans. <laughs> I don't see any Haitians. I don't see any Asian Americans. I don't, I, where are they? And she was like, you know, and so having to be exposed, parents have to expose their children to, and, and you know, talking about those differences. Hey baby, there are people who look different, but just because they look different, their character are, is wonderful. They have, you know, and, 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 and not being afraid to open up those conversations. Um, you know, we tend to be afraid of conversations that we, um, don't feel like we have all the answers, particularly as parents. If I don't have all the answers, I'm not gonna open that can of worms because guess what? Your kids are gonna ask those hard questions. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to, you know, I, 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 lots of stories. I remember being in the mall in, um, in Winston-Salem and there was a little person and my daughter at the time, she was asking all these questions and I was like, sweetheart, I don't know, but how about we do this? How about we ask her? And we walked up to her and I said, excuse me, ma'am, I mean, no disrespect, but my daughter has questions about the fact that you're so little, but she, and she knows that you're an adult. Would you mind sharing with her? And in that moment, she began to cry and she said, People allow their kids to stare and they never ask me to talk about the, me being a little person. I appreciate it. And she stood there and she very eloquently, very simplistically explained to my daughter, answered her questions. And I really believe in that moment, it did more for her than it really did for my daughter. So having those conversations, allowing those experiences, not being afraid, and understanding that there's room for us all. It's really beautiful. Um, and it relates uh, to a question that Susan Dunsmore, uh, or an observation, relates to an observation that she made. Um, she says, the asking of questions is hard though, because I hate making the assumption that black friends are responsible for educating me. And it's hard to know what are good questions and what feels like I think people owe me their time to answer questions that they don't owe me answers to. And I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna tell a story on myself right now. Um, 
<laughs> Dr. Carol and I are, are like friends outside of work too, but early in our relationship, and this came up when we were planning this class, we were at the pool at the YMCA and our kids were swimming. Like I didn't know her all that well, I, but like, I was just like, so Summer, what's it like to be a black person in Hickory? <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> or something like that I might have been a little bit more subtle but it was like a boom of a question and like a very mm -hmm. relaxed setting I think out of was it out of nowhere Summer? yeah and actually and actually we have spent a lot of time at the pool Taylor but that particular time was at the playground oh that was okay excuse me that was at the playground and that was our first meeting our first meeting. Okay. I think it was our first meeting, and we were just like, "Oh, you're working at LR. I work at LR, and you know, we had our kids." And it was, I think, in, in the way you said, it was more of like, um, "I never thought about what it would be like to be a black person in Hickory." And I don't know how we got to talking about. You know, we just, I think, we're talking about where we were from and how do we like the area. Those general type questions. Um, and I think that came up again, we were planning the course and we were doing our intros, you know, the lovely intro you see, well, that had many takes. <laughs> we had many takes. And I think on one of the takes, she didn't know I was gonna bring that up. And I brought it up and she said, well, what? I, I don't, of course, it's not that I never thought about it. And I said, well, no, it's okay. Because for me, the fact that you would, would bring it up showed to me that you have an interest and um, and so, you know, I, I put a little mental note like, hmm, this this is someone I might want to talk to a little more and, you know, let's try to develop a relationship. And so um, it wasn't a, a bad experience for me. And I will tell you that, I you know, you don't flinch in those situations. We're so used to it, quite honestly, of just, you know, um, just having, you know, the kind of stares or just the unbelievable like, oh, wow, you know, you're, you're a professor at LR type thing or just what's that like, you know? So um, I, the way I see it is we're all works in progress. And I always tell my students that. And, um, and so that's how I try to approach my relationships, you know, in interracial, cross-racial, just relationships in general, because we will always make mistakes sometimes or disappoint others. But it's about just recognizing, hey, do we all have a heart? Like you said, Dr. Hewitt, like, do we have an open mind? Are we just trying to to you know, grow and learn, um, and when I know that's the case, you know, I'm happy to have conversations. So I think even to Susan, who asked the questions, um, you know, I think, you know, I know there's lots of people who have written like, "Stop asking us questions," and we're, we're tired. Of, and I think during the George Floyd thing, it did kind of like we got a barrage of like, "Oh my goodness, yes." It was and it was just like, "Yo, I don't really want to talk about this," you know. <laughs> um, but in general, you know, just I think having conversations, it's I think it's fine. I'm happy to have conversations with people who have goodwill and, um, you know, want to chat. I think it's I think it's too, I think it's twofold in that, um, you know, part of it is relationship. So I'm listening to you, Dr. Newton, you know, and, and, and this and part of it is relationship. And even though there wasn't a solidified relationship between the two of you, there was a building block of relationship that was there. So I think that's one piece of it. The other piece of it, I would say, um, you know, you take into consideration intent versus impact. If this is an if this is an opportunity for me to talk about me, my experience, I cannot be, I refuse to be the um, poster child for every Black person in the world. I can't. That's a responsibility that I will not carry. And so, 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 and sometimes you, we find ourselves in spaces where you're the only Black person or you're the only Black female and you are looked upon to um, illuminate for the entire and you, it, it, and, and I, I myself have to be very, very diligent. And I can only tell you about me and my experience. So if I find that the intention is openness and I really want to learn and I'm really curious, I love having those conversations. That's again, that's, that's where learning begins. That's where those experiences open up. I'm never afraid of someone who is asking me a question 
Um, and I, I, I can sense that they're really looking for learning and information. Where it sometimes becomes hairy is when you get those questions that um, kind of hit you in the gut where you know there's some sort of ulterior motive there. When people are genuine with you, when people are authentic with you and, and you're like, oh, wow, they really want to know. It's completely different from somebody trying to trap you or trying to manipulate you into to something or trying to make some sort of judgment about Black people across the board based upon what you have to say. So I think, you know, don't be afraid to ask the questions, you know, ask the questions. Most people, unless it's a situation where I too, when the, with the whole George Floyd thing, I was like, don't talk to me. I can't. And that wasn't because I didn't, I didn't want to have the conversations emotionally. Mm -hmm. I was at zero. I was in the negative and I just could not. It hurt. It physically hurt. And I just could not. And rather than, you know, bite somebody's head off or be rude or disrespectful to somebody, I was just like, I can't, you know, so don't, don't. And, and here's the other thing. If someone says, I don't have an answer for you. I don't want to talk about it. Respect that. That's not them being disrespectful or, disres or, or or rude to you. You don't have any idea where they are. Like again, with the George Floyd thing, just wasn't there for a long time. I just could not have those difficult conversations. But that's okay, because that same grace that I am asking of others, I would ask that they give in return. You know, the other thing about uh, the George Floyd uh, tragedy for me was the fact that we saw that there were people that would stand with us. And I don't know why that surprised me so much, but I, I'm not somebody that sheds tears very easily. But when I'm watching this outrage around the world of people that look like us and people that don't, you know, it, it really surprised me. And I just felt like that that was just a slight turning point for, for what, was going to happen. But I've had times in, in sh I think shortly after that, I had a group of people. I'm the only person in the room of color. I'm facilitating a group and I get asked, what do black people want? Oh, <laughs> and my response was, because there are times where you get angry. And I said, well, because we are a collective and I answer for all those things that are black, let me tell you what that is. <laughs> Let's start with equity. You know, that's that's what it looks like. And, and then we can have a conversation later. But I knew it was a baiting conversation. And I just love the fact that with intuition, you know, you know, what why people are asking those questions. But I was really moved by the fact that there were people in the world that were surprised at what had happened, even though we've said this over and over, our experiences. Um, but that also that people stood up and stood with us at that time. So I'm, I'm extremely happy for that. Uh, it, the needle moved an inch. We've got a long way to go, but I was happy to see that. Absolutely. I just kind of want to add to this, um, to the person who initially asked about how to talk with children and as parents and, um, I think it's important, you know, like Dr. Hewitt said, to have, ex they need to have experiences like, and if you yourself aren't comfortable having cross-racial relationships, then most likely you're not going to take them around people who are different than them. So, you know, I think it starts from just allowing true relationships to form, um, re you know, reading texts together, going to events maybe normally you wouldn't go to. Um, but I think having just authentic relationships with people, um, there are other ways you can be similar. I mean, we've already learned, you know, the whole skin color thing, like we're more alike than we're different, right? We happen to have these different skin complexions, but there's a lot of other ways you can connect with someone and um, identify with them. Can I just say one more thing about this, this idea of children? Um, and I would encourage, I would encourage parents to, you know, so, so, so race and racism is a hot topic. It's a big topic and it's, it's, it's meaty and it's weighty and, and 
please do not burden your children with all of it. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Think about the age that your children, your children may be at. Think about their cognitive development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I used to teach um, sex ed in the schools. And um, at one point I had a parent say, you know, oh, I, 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 you know I, my, my kid asked me about, you know, puberty or something. And I just like word vomited it, like everything that I knew. And the kid was like, I was like, how do you spell it? You know, it was just like, and so I think that hap that, that can happen with trying to talk to your kids about race and you just want to just sort of word vomit everything. And, you know, take the opportunity, you know, if you're watching a television program and you notice that there is a black character or maybe the lack thereof, asking your child, well, what do you think is missing, you know, or what do you think this person brings to the, to the program or, you know, using those moments and bit by bit, when you, when you decide to have the conversation with your kids, don't have the conversation all at one time and then it's one and done. The same with race and racism. It's a continual conversation that needs to happen and it needs to be age appropriate Mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, age appropriate, checking in with understanding. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I can help. We can find some books to read. We can find some people to talk to, but please don't overload them um, with, oh my gosh, this is it. You know, and go into the, uh, you know, you have a six-year-old and you're like telling your six-year-old about the intricacies of you know, slavery and civil war mm -hmm. and civil rights movement. And the six-year-old is like, I have no idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. You, you, you lose them. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think, you know, we want so, for parents who are aware, they want so much to have aware children that they tend to overdo it. And then it becomes this like, well, I'll never ask that question again. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think that that's, that's another point that I would want to, to make clear too. Yeah, and I just say, I mean, I have children in that age group, and trust me, we are not at home talking about race and racism. Um, you know, they notice, they're starting to notice just that people's skin looks different, and that's it. They haven't been socialized. You know, they haven't taken all the other negative stuff in, and I think we can influence what they take in. And I think particularly about that video that you posted um, where they were on the plane, and the, the, the um, child thought the only, the only other Black man on the plane was her dad. Mm -hmm. then went on to say, I hope he doesn't rob the place, you know? And um, I thought, hmm, well, I've had times where I've been just walking around in Hickory or somewhere in Hickory and someone in my children think that someone is their dad. Mm -hmm. daddy. I'm like, no, it's not daddy. They don't follow up with, I hope that person isn't going to be a threat to us or isn't going to hurt us because somehow, you know, they haven't been fed that when you see that, that's what you should think. They haven't been fed it through TV, through music, through, you know, their experiences and what they're hearing me talk about. So you have to think about what are they hearing in your home? What are they hearing you listening to? What are they watching on the TV? Um, because that's how they might start to, you know, associate certain meanings to mm -hmm. race. But can I pivot this conversation for just a minute? We only have six minutes left. Um, but, you know, in our, in our last class, there was some, there was a student in a reflection who brought up the idea of kind of intra-racial conflict and tension. It, this happened to be a Latina student. And she talked about how, you know, her issue isn't with the white people, it's with her own who she feels are prejudiced against us. And so I, I, I think about um, the, um, the, the Killen article that you posted and there's a, a quote that I'll say, psychologists have found that people who form cross-group friendships when they're young are less likely to harbor prejudice as young adults. And um, I, just, I just wonder, is it more, when we're talking about, when we're talking about, um, and actually I think that was the wrong quote that I, that I read. Um, I don't remember the quote exactly, <laughs> but the point that I was trying to make is it's not, is it so much about the prejudice when we think about racism in the mind? I wanna talk about the trauma 
associated with living in a racialized society, um, particularly for people of color. And so I just wonder when you think about racism in the mind um, and you look at, okay, for instance, colorism in the, in the black community, um, if you're white or light, you're right. If you're black or dark, jump back. Um, how that's internalized and um, then perpetuated against one another. So I'm just thinking about how do we work through that trauma that has dug its way into our own communities? You know? I'm gonna de I'm gonna defer. I, I have an answer for you, or a, 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 but I want I want um, Jewel to to speak to this for for just a minute, if she would. Well, one thing I would say is is that. Um, most people do not want to align themselves with a group of people who often has been systematically kicked to the curb. Uh, so if there is a history of that, when you look at the entire Brown community, uh, we have internalized that so much so. And when, when I think personally about my own family, um, my grandparents were biracial, one was half black, one was half Cherokee, one was half black and one was half white. And so these women in my family looked anything from Filipino to Native American and was mistaken for that. And I often remember my aunt talking about when she was at Howard University, she was a retired Lieutenant Colonel Air Force for 25 years, but when she first went in, she had to do some training and she talked about the paper bag test. You know, if you're lighter than the paper bag or if you stick a pencil in your hair and the pencil falls out, then you, you're more acceptable because you're closer to being white. Uh, and she just didn't buy into that. And so I'm very fortunate that I grew up, even though I grew up with a family members that were so much lighter. I was the darkest person in my family. Um, it, it was about how they accepted me and how I was treated within that family. So it's a, it's a huge discussion. It's, it's so internalized with us, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, that it, 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 it has become a problem. And so when you look at other ethnicities that are brown and you look at the history, our history particularly of black people, Africans, uh, generally, most people don't want to align themselves that way. And if you take a look at South America, for example, there's so many color lines there. I mean, you don't have black, white, Native American, uh, Jewish. Um, you have so many different color lines. And all of that comes down to who is lighter. What does that look like? So I think it's so internalized. Um, it, we have to open the conversation with ourselves as well, amongst ourselves and what that means. And, and, and that's, that's exactly where my mind went. We have to have that, we have to begin having that difficult, um, uncomfortable conversation with ourselves. Um, and oftentimes we are very open and, and happy to have it when we're talking about external but we shy away from the internal. Um, and and there is this, there's this whole phenomenon about, you know, like you mentioned colorism, internal, that, that internal trauma. Um, and we have to start acknowledging the same way we want to have others, you know, we want white people to acknowledge, we have to look inside in our own communities and say, okay, wait a minute, we got to acknowledge this problem. We got to talk about it. We got to fix it because we are imploding from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, again, it goes back to, there's so many conversations that need to be had. There's so much healing that needs to be had and we cannot heal what we don't acknowledge. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's where it, you know, that, that's, that really is where it begins. And, and we have to do the same trauma work uh, internally mm -hmm. that, we do, that we expect to do externally. And again, we have to come to the table with an open mind, with an open heart, ready to receive, as well as being vulnerable enough to give. Mm -hmm. well, you know, uh, I, once again, we're at the end of our hour here, and I just want this conversation to keep going. Uh, if you feel that way too, uh, please 
post on YouTube tomorrow where a recording of this conversation will be uh, posted uh, as well as on Canvas. Um, next week, uh, as we mentioned, uh, we're gonna be meeting in person on LR's campus. Um, and we will also still be live streaming. Uh, and we'll be joined by Dr. Tunai Oguz. She's an associate professor of economics here at LR. And she's gonna be in this next week analyzing systemic racism and economic policy uh, from historical redlining to modern tax structures that tend to codify inequity. So we're gonna cover uh, a lot of ground. Um, so please, please join us. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Professor Hewitt and Ms. Gist, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.